Welcome to the 306th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Daniel Joshua Rubin, author of the book, 27 Essential Principles of Story, Master the Secrets of Great Storytelling, from Shakespeare to South Park. Stay tuned for the interview. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen to audiobooks during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Reading and Writing Podcast Special Offer. Get two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with code RWPODCAST. That's code RWPODCAST for two audiobooks for the price of one for your first month of membership at Libro.fm. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Daniel Joshua Rubin, author of the new book, 27 Essential Principles of Story, Master the Secrets of Great Storytelling from Shakespeare to South Park. Rubin has written for television, new media, and theater. He has also taught dramatic writing at Loyola University in Chicago and at the University of California, San Diego. Joshua, welcome to the, Daniel Washington, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Sure. Well, your new book is 27 Essential Principles of Story. We don't have to go we don't have time to go over all 27 principles and people need to buy your book obviously, but are there one or two principles of story that writers should keep in mind as they're working on their own screenplays, novels or short stories? Yeah, I would say if I it's funny I, I think a lot about, you know, the Pareto principle that you know 20% of the inputs make up for 80% of the outputs. And I do think about that. I'd say, I'd say the two that I think, if I could only pick like two off the top of my head, one is called right characters at the top of their intelligence, which, you know, literally means, you know, obviously a character could be as dumb as the guys on Dumb and Dumber, but they have to be doing the very best they can because the stakes of the, the story have to be, you know, such that, that people are giving it a hundred percent of their ability. And I think that that really pushes writers to take their writing to the next level by having them always be at the top of their intelligence. And then I'd say the next one is probably, I'd probably go with provoke dilemma, which means there's no easy choices for characters. You know, no one, uh, no one wants to watch someone make a, a really simple, obvious choice. There's just nothing to learn from it. So an example I use a lot is let's say you're going to work and you see an old lady slip and fall. Well, if you don't go, you know, there's no choice. And should you go help her? Of course you should. But if the night before the boss, the new boss told you, hey, I'm going to fire anyone who's even one second late. And you know for a fact he's going to do it. Well, now you have an interesting thing to write about. You know, because the guy who goes and helps the old lady and risks his job is a very different guy than the one who doesn't. So I'd say those are two good ones to start with. Well, most authors focus on plot to keep the narrative drive and people turning the pages. What recommendations do you have for writers to consider as they're working on plot? Um, you know, it's funny. The first 10 principles of my book deal with, with plot construction. And I worked very hard to, and I promise I'm going to answer that question, is, is I worked really hard to come up with a, with a path that has a lot of flexibility but is not, um, it's not going to strike, it's going to give you guideposts to hit. So I would say um, if, if you really want to keep the plot engaging, I think it's, it's critical to ask clear, dramatic questions. You know, and, and I'm a big fan of keeping things simple. When I studied the stories from my book, it's just amazing how even masterpieces like, um, the Godfather, um, even you know, Brothers Karamazov, it's always clear who's doing what and what they're trying to achieve. So keeping clear, dramatic questions, you know, simply as simple as 
what will happen, you know, ending scenes so that they provoke a question, I think is critically important. And then making sure to escalate the risks that your character takes as they move forward so that things get progressively more exciting and higher stakes as you move along. I'd say those are, those are two key things. Sure. Well, as you work with your students, are there common mistakes or issues in their writing that you see come up often and that you discuss with them? Absolutely. All the time. And I'd say by far the number one thing I deal with. And I think what I like to think makes my book kind of special is I'm fanatic about alignment, a tight alignment between who the author is at their core based on their personality, temperament, history, defining experiences. And I really feel that I look at that sort of like, you know, the thing, the space shuttle, they put it in that big grid thing before it launches. And that thing has to be aimed correctly when you take off on a journey of writing. And and no story, whether it's Juno Diaz, Toni Morrison, um, Alison Bechdel with the graphic novel Fun Home, um, there's no great story that I know of that you don't study the biography of the writer and see a tremendously tight alignment between who that writer is and what they're writing about. And that that doesn't mean they necessarily have to write, you know, exactly who they are and what they know. I know Toni Morrison didn't believe in that at all. She thought specifically don't write what you know, because she felt that allows you to tap into an even deeper kind of reservoir of your truth. But but I have to talk to my writers a lot. And I, I went to grad school and this was not something we talked about, which was shocking me, but I'd say that's the biggest one. What who are you? What kind of what's your genre? What are you meant to write about? Because that that and that's really that's gets you, I'd say, 70% of the way there. So that's a big thing. So for writers who may not be able to study in an MFA program, what recommendations do you have for self-editing and self-improvement with their writing? Uh, well, without a doubt, there's to just massively absorb the stories that you truly love. I, the thing that worries me the most about, especially about younger writers right now, is our culture is obsessed with judgment and ranking. You know, every post you make on social media is ranked and how many shares do you have, how many followers do you have. So knowing that you are constantly working in a genre you love, whether it's, again, whether it's Juno, I'm a big Juno Diaz fan, but it's Juno Diaz who always talks about, you know, how much he loves to read and the stories they read. So I would say it's, it's about immersing yourself in the stories you love and just... I don't want to say stealing, but really seeing how do the writers you love solve the problems that they love and, and know the principles of your craft. I mean, that's what my book is hardcore about. They're, they're fundamental. And I tried as hard as I could. To, and I don't mean to be like over pitching my book, I, mm-hmm. uh, but I really do want to say that like my book tries really hard to put everything in plain English and to be as close to objective truth as it could be, meaning that if a scene has a dramatic question, if it's fueled by a clear question, it's almost certainly going to be a better scene. If the dialogue is actionable, you know, if it has subtext or in my chapter I call it hidden meaning, though, so, so know the fundamentals of your craft. That, that's, I just can't imagine how that won't make you a better writer. And I, and it, I really believe it will not limit creativity, but actually push it to the next level. And do you recommend that writers participate in writing groups? Uh, to be honest, I, I, I have nothing like it. it. Obviously, it's a very personal decision. But when I look back on my career, I really do feel I was kind of overeducated. Like I studied writing in undergrad. I studied writing in graduate school. I got right out of grad school and went into an agent. I had an agent and, and I I was actually part of the famous Circle Rep Writers Lab way back in the day. Circle Rep was a big famous theater in New York where Lanford Wilson, the great playwright, came out of there. And, and I guess in my experience, I don't think it's the best. In all honesty, I 
I just think most of them are not that great. Maybe that's arrogant of me or maybe negative of me. But I think the most important thing, again, when I look at the writers that I love the most, they know who they are. They have fierce confidence. They're, they know what they're interested in. They know their genre. They know why they write. And they write on their own terms. Um, again, like Toni Morrison used to write what she needed to write. And, and she wrote on her own time. And she didn't take uh, deals to sell her books before she wrote them. And when they were ready and they met her standards, she gave them to the world. And that I think I see that again and again and again in the, when I study the biographies of my favorite writers and the great writers. So, no, I really don't. I, I'd say that time is way better spent living, doing interesting things, getting psychologically sophisticated. I, I actually big fan of therapy. You, you got to know who you are and move with authenticity. And I think writers' groups tend to, they tend to, unless they're an amazing writing group. I mean, if you're J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, yeah, be in that writers' group. But um, so anyway, sort of ramble there. But I think, no, I do not think you need to be in a writers' group. I think this is a solitary game and you've got to be comfortable in your own skin. So what are your earliest memories of writing and what led you to a career in writing? Uh, it's funny. I actually was, I, I, my earliest memory of writing was reading a short story. I mean, uh, I loved Aesop's fables when I was really young and I come from Brooklyn and I'm, I'm not saying I'm from like such a tough neighborhood, but it might've been a little tougher than, than others. And I remember dealing with a bully and how there was a short story, I mean, a fable by Aesop that was about a, a wolf that's bullying a lamb and that, and he keeps coming up with reasons why he's going to, why the lamb had offended him. And in the end, he eats the lamb and the, the fable, I mean, the moral was that any excuse will serve a tyrant. And I just remember being so blown away by how such a little short story could capture a truth that I had figured out at a very young age. So I wrote my own fables and I just always seemed to get by far the best responses to my work. Um, and, and maybe this is worth saying really quick, but like I was never a great math and science student. That stuff didn't come naturally to me. I'd forget what I read in two seconds, but if I read a short story, I remember that an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, you know, where the guy has a fantasy before he gets hanged. And I can remember every detail of the story because it's just maybe the way and I really do believe there's a, a kind of intelligence that isn't easy to quantify in school. So for me, long, um, for me, I always got the best grades in writing things, and it just, it just I just kind of gravitated to it kind of naturally. So, what novels or nonfiction books or television shows have you enjoyed recently? <laughs> um. Well, it's funny, the, the, the novel that really, really, really knocked my socks off, even though I read it a bunch, but in, in studying my book, for my book, I, I'm a real Brothers Karamazov fanatic, that, that really, and, and to be honest, I have kind of, kind of, uh, in TV, I'm, I, I just loved Breaking Bad, I just thought that was incredible that he kept basically six seasons, it was like a 52-hour single episode if you really look at it and, and i thought the way he kept that thing engaging from start to finish was was really amazing um but karamazo is the one that that i'd say shook me the most because it's just it was just so fantastic diving into it um so point. where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your book 27 essential principles of story Sure. I have a website called story27.com and my school's kind of on hiatus because of the COVID, but um, I did make a 27 part video series, which includes just short three minute videos. You get one every day and they cover the 27 essential principles, one for each chapter. And I kept them real short, real sweet, right to the point. So you can get that at that site. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Daniel Joshua Rubin, author of the new book, 27 Essential Principles of Story, Master the Secrets of Great Storytelling from Shakespeare to South Park. 
The book is available now, so go grab a copy. And Daniel, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks a lot.